We now move to listed questions for the Minister for Employment and Learning. I must inform the House that questions 3, 10 and 14 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Gary Middleton. Question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, while my department provides funding and sets the, the strategic direction for the higher education sector, universities are autonomous and are wholly responsible for decisions on course offerings and where the courses are delivered. The institutions are at liberty to deploy their funding across the various campuses where applicable and on the different courses that they offer. In deciding which courses to close or scale back, Ulster University took a number of factors into consideration, including the priorities of my department, such as protecting narrow STEM provision, student demand, attrition rates, student satisfaction, employment statistics and research performance. The University has also consolidated teaching provision into its campuses to facilitate the necessary reduction of staff numbers without impacting on the quality of teaching, which, which uh, remains paramount. Mr Middleton for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer. Uh, later this week, I will be meeting with the Vice-Chancellor, Paddy Nixon, to discuss these matters. Uh, does the Minister agree that whilst we all want to see the University out at McGee expanded, it is vital that the courses on offer uh, are focused towards the needs and demands in the area, specifically computing and health and social care as well? Well, I wish the, the member uh, success with this meeting uh, with uh, the, the, the vice chancellor. I'm sure it'll be it'll be very productive, and the member. In that respect, of the supplementary, should take some degree of comfort. And while we are, and that while we are going through some very difficult times, the university has sought to, to consolidate uh, particular types of courses at particular campuses rather than spreading them out. And that way, they try to stretch themselves that ever bit further in terms of protecting the range of courses on offer and also the numbers of places that can be uh, facilitated. And indeed, they have uh, consolidated both engineering and computing into the, their McGee uh, campus, which hopefully uh, will reinforce uh, its uh, relevance. In particular, to the opportunities to expand the economy in the North West. Call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. For that update, uh, can I ask the Minister specifically then maybe to give an update on the current business case for McGee expansion and indeed where he thinks the expansion issue will sit in terms of the restructuring of departments? Well, well, first of all, in terms of the business case, uh, we have asked for, for uh, further clarification. On a number of points. Uh, and that request was made by my officials uh, at the beginning of July uh, this year. We have yet to receive the, the revised business case. And, uh, I would encourage uh, those uh, who are finalising it to get, get it to us as quickly as, as possible, uh, not least given that decisions on budgets um, are, are looming. Ultimately, the issue of the, the, uh, of the expansion lies with, with higher education. As a member will appreciate, um, higher education is set to be uh, part of the new Department of the Economy. Um, from May 2016 onwards. Call well, Mr. Robin Swan. The Minister referred to the relocation of courses to McGee. Can he say what's actually happened to the psychology courses? Well, my understanding is I think psychology is, is uh, being uh, redirected in, in terms of Korean. So the, the process in terms of things being consolidated in McGee has also been uh, reflected in terms of similar decisions being taken uh, with respect to the other uh, campuses. Uh, as I've outlined already, there is a strategic approach being made, uh, and, uh, which is also about trying to maximise the ability to retain as many courses as possible uh, and also to protect as many places as possible. So that is a way of uh, maximising the efficiency of the university insofar as it can, uh, operating across uh, four different campuses. Call Mr Patsy McGlone. Uh, I'm going to for you will ask you call you. Cash um, over the door, the uh, hall. Thanks very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number two, please. Um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I wish to group questions two and four. I would like to request an additional minute for the answer. I launched the big conversation on the 15th of September as an innovative and experimental approach to engaging with people about the sustainability and the future of the higher education system. It concluded on, on the 23rd of October. The process was, was designed to be iterative, uh, comprising two main stages, which were themed on a week-by-week -week basis. The first stage, called Did You Know, ran for the first three weeks and focused on raising public awareness about the purpose and importance of our existing higher education system. This was followed by a second stage called Have Your Say, which launched on the 6th of October and invited people to put forward their views on some of the most critical issues facing our, 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 our um, higher education system. During the first stage, people were invited to test their knowledge about our existing system through online Did You Know style surveys. The second stage was more akin to traditional consultation. Equipped with the knowledge gained in stage one, people were invited to have their say on a range of issues through a consultation questionnaire. 
Questions focused on the adequacy and the sustainability of our existing higher education uh, funding and delivery systems, and whether there might be alternatives which would work better for Northern Ireland. During the process, my officials and I sought to uh, stimulate debate and encourage uh, to, to, to engage with people in a wide range of ways. We had formal meetings with stakeholders, we had workshops, focus groups, and a Twitter Q&A in the week to answer people's questions directly. Various other stakeholders, including our, our universities and, and colleges, promoted the process through their, through their own channels. In the final week, my officials also organised a panel discussion to examine some of the different higher education funding and delivery systems maintained in other parts of the world. That event was very well attended and received, and we are fortunate to secure some excellent panellists. Now that the big conversation has concluded, building upon the evidence presented, I am currently finalising a paper to present to my executive colleagues outlining the ways in which higher education could be sustained in the future. Mr McLoan, first supplement. Thanks very much, Minister, for your response. Um, could the Minister just outline to me, please, in, uh, in what way, in fact, those uh, at the end of the day, who will be most affected by this, secondary school students will have an input into this process of consultation. Well, well the consultation uh, has closed, and I have outlined already to, to the member uh, the different ways in which people could make their views known. That included the, the, uh, the, the different uh, online uh, opportunities, as well as the, the opportunity to submit uh, formal uh, re responses. Uh, I would also stress to the member as well that uh, when he talks about uh, secondary school children being those who are most affected by this, to an extent he is true, but there are many other stakeholders that will be affected by this situation. That includes the businesses in Northern Ireland, uh, at uh, wider society, our future economic potential. So what is at stake in terms of what is currently happening to higher education is, is extreme, and it is important that over the coming weeks uh, the executive uh, can find a, a solution that is going to be sustainable uh, in the long term. Call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer, um, but does he accept that proposals to increase tuition fees would have a negative impact on his department's commitment to widen access to people from disadvantaged areas? We have just heard from the Minister for Education about the increase, for example, in West Belfast of young people getting uh, better qualifications, um, and, but does, he, does the Minister accept that this could, his proposals um, could actually disadvantage if, the, uh, if tuition fees were increased, could disadvantage pupils from disadvantaged areas? Well, first of all, let me be very clear. I have not proposed an increase uh, in uh, tuition fees. I have simply outlined the fact that our current system is unsustainable. Uh, my first uh, priority is to ensure that we have a sustainable system uh, for the future of our economy, future of society, and also to give uh, young people um, opportunities. Uh, until we uh, can find a solution that, uh, that around which we have a political consensus, all options do remain on the table, though I, at this stage I am not advocating a, a, an increase in tuition fees. Um, Whenever the member says that a rise in tuition fees would have an impact in terms of uh, widening access, on a pure standalone basis, yes, I concur with her. Uh, that would be a deterrent to some people uh, from accessing higher education. But I think it's only right uh, and proper that we make clear that the, the cuts that the executive have imposed in my department, and I have very sadly had to pass on to universities, have already had an impact in terms of people's ability to access higher education. Because we have had a situation where we have fewer places on offer uh, from this year, uh, that means that some people will be forced uh, to go to, to Great Britain or elsewhere in the world and be forced often to pay higher tuition fees than would be on, on offer in Northern Ireland. Or in some cases, people have, have had no opportunity to go uh, to university at all and they have uh, lost out on a life uh, transformational um, op opportunity. So we are seeing very real costs already in, in this respect. And those people who are coming from the more marginalised and vulnerable sections of our society, Society, who will be impacted most uh, by the loss in places. And, uh, while we are hearing uh, potential figures of, of cuts to departments uh, coming up, it is important to recognise that if we see a similar situation arising uh, for our universities for this forthcoming academic year, then we will see further reduction in places, which will have a, another detrimental impact in terms of people's opportunities and our widening access uh, uh, targets. Call Mrs. Sander over here. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, uh, does he intend to make his recommendations on the funding of further and higher education this side of the election? Or uh, was the big conversation a big delaying tactic uh, to avoid potentially unpopular decisions? 
Well, uh, let, me, let me say, I hear the, 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 uh, the former uh, minister who did exactly that in terms of actually parking a decision to the far side of the election saying, here, here. Um, so clearly, uh, we, we know where, where the form lies uh, in, this, uh, in, in this particular regard, uh, which I think was why my department was chosen last, because the, the political hot potato of tuition fees uh, was left uh, unresolved uh, un until after uh, the, the Assembly election. What happens very much is in the hands of the Executive and also uh, the Assembly. But let me be very clear. I am determined to get this issue resolved. We can't park this issue. We can't afford to park this issue. Our universities are bleeding already. We have issues that, uh, will, uh, if unresolved, will undermine our credibility in terms of an investment location. Uh, shortly, we're about to have a question around uh, a lower level of, of corporation tax. Uh, already, our investment narrative is, is, in, is, is in jeopardy uh, because we don't have a, a very clear uh, outcome in terms of this sustainability of our higher education system. So I'm working uh, sternly uh, to try to resolve uh, the, these issues. We will have a paper uh, before the executive within the, within the next uh, number of weeks. So there's an opportunity for all parties uh, to take a, a responsible decision in terms of the, what is the best uh, way forward. There are clear choices that we can, we, that we can make. Uh, tuition fees remains uh, an option uh, that is open uh, to the executive, but they also have the option of doing something more in line with what happens in Scotland, uh, where more money is actually redirected uh, from the block grant into supporting uh, our university. So that's another option that's available. Of course, that's happening in the context where money is to be taken out uh, of our budgets in order to have uh, a more generous welfare system. And that may or may not be the right thing uh, for, for us to be doing, but that, that, that's what is about to happen. And we have a whole host of other populist decisions that are being taken uh, around uh, other public services and other, and other types of commitments. So it's in that context that we have to uh, see what is going to be doable. But it is up to the executive over the coming weeks uh, to try to take a decision in terms of what going to happen in the here and now. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, just as the Minister mentioned, um, given the executive decision uh, in lowering the corporation tax in 2018, what scale of investment is required now for our young people in anticipation of more inward investment coming online? Well, I thank the member for, for her question. And to put this in context, it's maybe useful to see this in terms of three or four uh, dif different elements. Um, first of all, we have the cut to higher education um, that was passed on for the 15-16 financial year. Uh, that amounts to 16.1 million. We have a pre-existing structural deficit in terms of our university funding, which amounts to about 39 million. That's based upon a comparison between the cost uh, of money we're investing per student in Northern Ireland relative uh, to, to the rest of the, of the, of the UK. We then thirdly have to look to what potential expansion we need to see in terms of higher education uh, to meet the needs of investing companies uh, in, in response to a lower level of cooperation tax. And also, we, we've already heard as well, there are ambitions uh, to expand Ulster University uh, at, at McGee. And uh, while we're still waiting the business case, it's likely that we will be talking about a figure in the region of £30 million uh, per annum if we are to see uh, the, the uh, expansion in line with the one plan uh, targets. So you, very quickly, you see that we're talking a figure in, in excess of £80 million uh, per year. Uh, being required to have a sustainable uh, higher education system in Northern Ireland that meets the needs of our economy, both today but also, more importantly, where we hope to be tomorrow. Call Mr. John Dowlett. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, question number five. Um, while my department provides funding and sets the, the strategic direction for the higher education sector, uh, universities are autonomous and responsible for their own staffing levels. However, I have had ongoing discussions with Ulster University in relation to the, potential, uh, the possible implications of the budget reductions and have been briefed on the redundancy process by the Vice-Chancellor on a regular basis. The University has already indicated the scale of the job losses over the current academic year and over future years. The size of these cuts is a clear indication of the severity of the budget reductions faced by my department, the University and the higher education sector. Ulster University has reported to my officials that the deadline for expressions of interest in the voluntary severance scheme closed on the 30th of October, and they are now liaising with the deans of the affected faculties before beginning the process of staff engagement. Mr. Dallet, first supplementary. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, does it not break the Minister's heart that he has been responsible for reducing funding to the universities at a time when the whole world is telling us that the only way that we can uh, create jobs for people who are travelling to the four corners of the world to find work, because the work is not at home. And the very thing that would be the driver to create the jobs 
has been starved of the oxygen of life in Coleraine and in Derry in particular. Well, let me be very clear. The decisions regarding my departmental budget were taken at an executive level, and I was deeply concerned about a whole range of issues in terms of, of the budget. Um, and I would ask that the member um, to reflect in terms of his own party's approach to how we are addressing uh, our budget issues, because his party, uh, like others, is very clear that they are not prepared to consider uh, any additional revenue raising for Northern Ireland. Um, parties are very clear that they are not prepared to consider tackling the costs of, of a divided society. We could not even begin to address divisions in our teacher training system um, er, er, earlier on uh, this year. We are not adopting a strategic approach uh, to, to, to budget setting. Um, parties are making more and more demands in terms of what they are wanting to spend uh, money, money on. We are seeing a situation where money is going to be taken out of our block grant in terms uh, of welfare. We are seeing people making commitments ahead of even the full assessment of all the different needs that we, we must protect health at all costs rather than actually engaging in any health programme. And then people wonder why we have a situation where we are having cuts to our skills budgets and we are seeing cuts uh, being passed on uh, to uh, universities. It is important that people, if they are genuinely concerned about this, that they have a fundamental reassessment as to how, as to how they are resourcing all that we need to do in terms of funding our public services, including our universities, as well as how we fund the transformation of our economy. And I would encourage the member and indeed those in all parties to think very seriously about these issues over the coming weeks. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, question six, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. It is essential that we are well placed to derive the full benefits of a 12.5 corporation tax rate which could significantly increase the jobs that would otherwise be produced locally. However, a lower rate will not transform the economy in isolation of investment in and a coherent focus around the key economic drivers of skills and employability as the bedrock of economic success. It is crucial that we maintain and increase our investment in skills if we are to derive the benefits of a lower rate. Research commissioned by my department highlights in particular the importance of strong skills in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, management and leadership and literacy, numeracy and employability skills and the importance of acting quickly to meet the skill needs of employers in a lower corporation tax environment. These are issues that my department is already working to address, and they are central to the overarching skills strategy. However, although the department is already on the right path, there will be a need to fr for further investment to address the quantum of skills required. My department has developed a draft action plan to direct our skills interventions and preparation for and in response to a lower rate. This covers existing policies and programmes such as investment in STEM skills, the implementation of the new apprenticeship strategy, and in particular the supply of skills at level three and above, developing new pathways such as higher level apprenticeships, our work in partnership with InvestNI to promote foreign direct investment, the further development of careers provision, and the work to upscale the existing workforce. Together with the information from the recently published Skills Barometer, this will provide a strong basis to articulate and address future skill needs and so help to ensure that we realise the potential for a lower rate. However, in order to ensure that we maximise this economic opportunity, it is essential that an appropriate level of investment in skills is restored, the structural de uh, deficit of, of underfunding in higher education is addressed, and we invest in additional measures to ensure we meet the, the forecast skills demand. The financial analysis under undertaken indicates that the total additional cost may be the region of an average of £111 million per annum over the next 15 years, or a total of £1.67 billion in total through to 2030. Mr Anderson, first supplementary. I thank you, and I thank the Minister for that response. Minister, can you tell us how you plan to help uh, existing businesses prepare for the corporation tax uh, reduction in 2018, especially in areas such as the staff training, and I know you have already mentioned apprenticeships, uh, and can you give an indication of how your department will be working with Getty in preparation for 2018? Well, on the latter point, we are due to have uh, some discussions tomorrow as part of the um, economic uh, subcommittee of the, of the executive. So uh, hopefully that will be begin to, to crystallise some of these discussions, and those discussions are happening at official level uh, already uh, in, in this regard. In terms of interventions, it will be upscaling some of the existing interventions that we have. For example, what we're doing around the apprenticeship strategy. We've spoken already at length around the, the importance of funding of, of universities. Uh, perhaps another area that is worth highlighting is 
the importance of uh, management and leadership skills. And as we bring in more and more um, high-value investments in Northern Ireland, there will be a, a greater premium placed upon uh, management and leadership. Uh, sadly, we've had uh, some quite severe cutbacks in terms of existing provision uh, over the past uh, couple of years. That will need to be uh, tur turned around and, and reversed. And we're also conducting a review of management and leadership at present. Uh, hopefully, that will be concluded before uh, the end of this mandate. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, would you concede that, particularly at the beginning of the cooperation tax in 2018, there might be a, a, a falling in tax, in tax uh, intake? Do you believe that that would have a detrimental effect on the funds available for your employability schemes and, and um, for training schemes at a time when you would actually need greater funds for that? Well, it's almost certain that there will be uh, a fall in terms of the resources available uh, to, to the executive. Uh, and I think anyone who's looked at the, the figures around this will see that we will be looking in terms of what will be a figure that will progressively rise to a figure in the region around about perhaps uh, 250 to 300 million pounds uh, per, per annum. Um, over, over time, of course, more and more revenue will be generated uh, in Northern Ireland uh, as we see a much greater level of economic activity uh, being sparked by a lower corporation uh, tax. We do have this particular dilemma in, in the context that it is very clear that we have to invest more in terms of what we're doing around skills if we are to see a, a lower corporation tax uh, rate being successful. If we don't invest in skills, that simply won't be the case. That same logic also applies to further investments in terms of infrastructure, uh, some reforms uh, to, to, uh, to the planning system. But the real dilemma that the executive will have is that that increase in funding needs to happen now, but that's also going to happen at the time when we're seeing cuts to the block grant, where we're seeing money being taken out of our um, uh, own block grant uh, for additional flexibilities around uh, welfare, and uh, obviously where we are, we also have to make the deficit in terms of lost revenue from a lower level of corporation tax. Call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, question number seven. Um, enabling success, the Executive's new strategy aimed at reducing the level of economic inactivity in Northern Ireland was published on the 20th of April 2015. The implementation of the strategy uh, over the proposed 15-year period is based on 11 key projects to be managed and resourced on a cross-departmental basis. However, due to the ongoing pressure on budgets and the subsequent absorption of these pressures through departmental baselines, the enabling uh, success strategy remains largely unresourced and implementation severely hindered. In my, in my department, there has been a reduction to the departmental baseline funding of 8.4 per cent, uh, totalling £63.3 million in 2015 and 16. A research mapping exercise of economic and activity uh, serv service provision in Northern Ireland aimed at the strategy's key target group groups has been completed. In addition, the Department for Social Development leads on a pilot project in the new Derry and Strabane District Council area. This pilot project received funding via the Executive Change Fund for 2015 and 16, and it is based on early and more intensive engagement with new claimants of the Employment and Support Alliance benefit. The remaining cross-departmental projects have yet to commence due to the lack of financial and other resource allocations. Updated indicative project costs have been provided for ongoing discussions between the Executive parties. Should the Executive secure additional finance to enable the full, full or part implementation of the strategy, a new implementation plan and timetable will be agreed between the relevant Executive Departments. Well, Ms. Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his update? However, as we know, it's long been established that there are areas of Northern Ireland with unacceptable acceptably high levels of economic activity. As you say, you launched this strategy with a statement back in April, and as has recently been reported, it is largely unresourced, and many of the projects have not commenced due to lack of resources. Minister, um, are you content to be associated with a monumental failure and lack of prior prioritisation from this executive? Well, what I would say is that um, this is a collective failure across the piece uh, because the executive has not been in a position to direct uh, resources in, in that regard and the members party uh, were present uh, when those uh, decisions are, are taken and uh, since her party has uh, left the executive into the uh, so-called opposition mode we haven't seen any 
alternative narrative that would lead to a situation where the resources would be available uh, for us uh, to invest in this particular strategy. Now, there are two potential uh, sources of funding uh, looming on the landscape, none of which are, are definite by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but that are worth exploring. First of all, obviously, the executive now has the, uh, the, the money that was originally set aside uh, to, to mitigate the effect of the loss of tax credits, uh, on which decisions uh, have still to be made. And obviously, anything we do to invest in, in the, our economic and activity strategy is about removing people uh, from welfare by encouraging them into work in a very supportive uh, manner. So that is something that is consistent uh, with the wider welfare reform process, which is about trying to tackle uh, the causes rather than simply just trying to deal uh, with the symptoms where people are are stuck in a, in a spiral uh, of, of welfare and, and, the, and one of lack of opportunity. The second piece also lies in terms of the Fresh Start deal. A reference is made to new measures uh, to address error and fraud in terms of benefits uh, in Northern Ireland and through what's called a, an Amy Dell switch. Uh, North, the Northern Ireland Executive has the potential to receive 50 per cent of the, the savings uh, that do accrue to the Treasury uh, through the successful efforts in that regard. And that um, uh, deal does make reference to addressing some elements of, of, uh, of work and health well-being as being um, one possible route uh, through which those resources uh, could be deployed. Those are obviously discussions that we have to, to continue further at an executive level, uh, but those are potentially two uh, particular avenues through which some resources could be made available to commence work on this strategy. Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the Minister's answers, I'm assuming that uh, um, the new mental health strategy has also been negatively impacted as enabling success also aimed uh, to encourage positive mental health uh, through work. Well, as I said in the in the. Uh the main answer. At this stage, we only have one uh, potential pilot programme operating through uh, DSD. The, the, the rest of the strategy is, at this stage is parked, uh, pending the allocation of, of resources. Um, I would like to think that resources will be made available. This is an important area. This is a major structural problem uh, within our economy in, in Northern Ireland, and it is imperative that we press on uh, and seek to address this. And This is a, is a much more beneficial way uh, to address the situation where people unfortunately find themselves on welfare and there are many people who are on welfare who do actually want to engage in the world of work but are coming across uh, barriers uh, that are preventing them to, for, from doing that and we wanted to see how we can actually tackle and remove those, those barriers. Mr Edwin Poots is not in his place. Mr Ian McRae is not in his place. I call Mr Robin Swan. Question number 11. Uh, the Department's key priority in developing any element uh, under the 2014-20 European Social Fund programme is to ensure that the participants receive the best possible training and education available to them. Any departmental requirements of qualifications for teaching or tutoring st uh, staff apply to tutors in further education college settings and providers of the Training for Success programme, as well as educators in the ESF projects. In each, uh, each one of these contexts, the primary rationale is to ensure quality and consistency uh, throughout education and training across Northern Ireland and to provide a guaranteed minimum level of quality in our teaching. We cannot and should not lose sight of the fact that it is the participants of the, on the ESF projects and therefore the quality of training they receive that should remain our primary focus. My officials are continuing to consider a paper submitted on this issue by the Northern Ireland Council on Voluntary Action and will respond in due course. But it is important that the rationale for the introduction of this requirement is clearly understood. Mr. Swan, for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal. Did you speak? And I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister then inform those organisations who are waiting how they get, gain a tutor in CSR cards and first aid cards, and also an organisation that is recognised by OCR when that qualifi teaching qualification actually doesn't reflect that? Uh, th thank you, Member, for the first question and, and, uh, and those comments. Um, we, we certainly have made very clear to our, to our officials that we want them to work through those very practical issues that are being raised uh, by the different organisations. I, mean, I am aware of the concerns that, that have been uh, expressed around, uh, for example, bo both capacity issues and uh, how other qualifications uh, are being recognised in, in this regard. Uh, and uh, certainly, I do want to give a commitment that we are looking to see how we can work through those issues in a constructive way to reaching.
a, a, a resolution. I, what I would stress to the member and indeed the Assembly is the importance of ensuring that we have, have quality. And I'm sure everyone would share that, that objective that uh, right across our education and training system, we want to make sure that those who are providing the training uh, are, are operating to the very, the very highest standards. But I, I do accept that there can be at times different ways in which uh, that can be uh, assessed and accredited. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Like many, the Minister will be aware uh, of the intensive uh, nature of talks uh, leading up to the Fresh Start Agreement, which had mixed outcomes. Can the Minister point to any advantages for those who access further and higher education in both the Fresh Start document and in the November monitoring round? Well, um, on the surface, no, and, but I wasn't particularly expecting any huge commitments uh, in those particular regards. I mean, this was, was meant to be a, a political deal. Um, uh, insofar uh, of that uh, particular bar, it, it was a deal in, in some respects uh, between some parties uh, covering some areas and not necessarily all areas. Um, perhaps like him, uh, I would have liked to have seen a, a stronger commitment uh, at, a, at a general level in terms of how we could better uh, invest and plan uh, in our economy and set and train a process by which we have a, a better planning process where we can draw upon international experience, where we can benchmark our progress in, in, in Northern Ireland. And I think the omission of that was perhaps a, a, a lost opportunity, but I wasn't necessarily expecting any particular lines or, or commitments in relation to either further education or, or higher education, though in due course uh, those would have been picked up uh, through uh, a more general process around uh, promotion, the promotion of economic uh, prosperity and opportunity. Mr McKinney, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree that for corporation tax to work properly and to benefit all uh, in society here, we need a, a high productivity, high waged and high skilled economy, and that as recent cuts in places to universities is entirely counter strategic uh, to the introduction of corporation tax here and that ambition? Yes, yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I entirely um, concur with the sentiments that the member has expressed, and indeed that's been a, a major focal point uh, of, of question time uh, to date. And I would simply echo the point that I've, I've, I've made that it's important that uh, as we look ahead to making our own budget decisions over the coming weeks and months, that we very much have in mind um, some of the things that have been done in the past uh, and also the requirements uh, of, of the future. And indeed, it's important that we start now to further invest uh, in, in skills, simply waiting to 2018 uh, to invest more in skills uh, isn't going to be effective. Uh, we now have essentially that uh, two-year window, uh, and it's important that we send a, a very clear message that Northern Ireland is open for business from day one when people are looking to make investments based upon uh, that lower corporation tax rate. Mr. George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I know that the Minister has touched on this, uh, the topic, but could the Minister confirm if his department has applied for any of the 240 million bid from tax credits to alleviate some of the financial cutbacks to his department? Well, thank the member for the question. At this stage, um, we haven't been inv invited to make bids uh, by either the executive as a whole or the minister for uh, finance uh, and personnel. Obviously, decisions in relation to uh, how that money uh, will be reallocated uh, are still to be taken uh, by the executive. The point I, I would stress is that there are many ways in which we can help those who are most vulnerable and marginalised uh, in this society. Obviously, mitigations of the Tory welfare policies being, being pursued uh, in Great Britain uh, is one uh, such way, but we have to have a balance in terms of the approach that we are taking. And there are areas, for example, further investments in public health, uh, early years uh, education, uh, as well as investments in my own areas of responsibility around uh, employment schemes, training schemes, uh, uh, opportunities in terms of further education and higher education, which are all very important in terms of giving people the opportunity uh, to progress in life uh, and, all, and to essentially move off uh, dependency on welfare. So it's important that we have that balance in terms of the approach that we're taking. Robinson, first supplement. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Maybe a bit hypothetical, but if successful in his bid, would that money go back into your universities who had their funding already cut? Uh, I, I congratulate the member on, on the, his, uh, his bravery and trying to entice me along that line. There's a lot of ifs uh, in that uh, ch chain uh, of, of logic. Um, what I would say is that uh, there are things that can be done 
differently in relation to helping those uh, who are on welfare. Clearly, we've had discussions around uh, economic in inactivity, and I think if the, a decision was taken to redirect uh, those resources, that type of intervention on things maybe to help people who are unemployed in terms of youth unemployment in particular, uh, or long-term unemployment as well, it would be uh, perhaps most relevant in terms of how people see the transparency as to how that money is, is moving from one intervention uh, to another. The comments I've made around uh, upskilling and um, including uh, comments around higher education, I think have to be freestanding commitments that the executive make because they are core requirements of, of us delivering a successful uh, economy. So I don't think it's a, it's a case that we simply move tax, money from tax credits into higher education. Uh, as tempting as that is, I think th th what we're saying around higher education must stand on its own two feet and be seen as a core uh, responsibility uh, of, of the executive in terms of upskilling and having a successful transformed economy. Mr. Sean Lynch. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister whether he is minded to retain maintenance grants? Um, at, at this stage, there are no plans to change the situation in terms of uh, maintenance grants. And even if there was, that there would be a, a lead-in time in terms of, le of secondary legislation uh, going through uh, this, this assembly. Um, I do think it is important that maintenance grants uh, do uh, stay in place, and, and they are important in terms of uh, widening access. Um, I was in Scotland, for example, last week, and there they have moved to a situation where maintenance is funded more through, through, through loans than necessarily uh, through grants. And that there are ongoing debates and discussions around how well they're doing in terms of, of widening uh, participation. Obviously, we've seen a situation where uh, the, the UK government have, have uh, proposed the removal of maintenance grants uh, for the, the, the situation uh, in England. Now, exactly how that works out in terms of negative barn consequentials for Northern Ireland uh, remains uh, to be seen. But the decision as to whether we keep the situation, I think, is one that the executive will have to take collectively. Uh, but my working assumption is that people will, will want to see the status quo continue, because that's more in keeping with the particular circumstances we find ourselves in Northern Ireland. Mr. Lynch, for a supplement. Gorm Gwick has done our election fragmentation, and I acknowledge the, what the Minister has said about the importance of maintenance grants, but would he say that they are vital in supporting students from less well off areas for future and higher education? Yes, that, that's very much the, the logic as, as to why uh, they're there, and uh, while there has been that commitment uh, to maintenance grants, um, I would say, of, of course, that as part of the, the tightness in terms of resources uh, over the past number of years, as part of the wider uh, tuition fee settlement, that we haven't had the same opportunity uh, to in, invest uh, in, in maintenance because the resources haven't simply be, been there. But in, in, in their own right, yes, maintenance grants uh, are an important tool in terms of ensuring that we attract people from a whole range of backgrounds. In in, uh, to higher education. I think it's crucially important for the future of our economy that the ability to pay isn't seen as a barrier to people participating in higher education. Um, access to higher education should be based upon merit and people's ability uh, to, to learn and uh, to, to gain uh, from that experience. Well, Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, we had a meeting this morning, some of my colleagues, with the staff management from the Four Seasons um, care homes about closures. One of the problems that they identified is the lack of nurses, trained nurses in Northern Ireland. Um, does the Minister have, or your department, have any plans to, to uh, uh, train and upgrade um, uh, people for, for those jobs in Northern Ireland? Well, I think it's important um, that we, we draw a distinction between the types of roles that are uh, available in terms uh, of uh, res residential homes. Uh, as a member will appreciate, uh, nursing itself and the training of nurses is a matter for the Department of Health. They set the numbers. They, they also provide the finance uh, for, uh, for nurses. So I've no doubt that the member's colleague will be aware of that. There are, of course, other roles in, in health and social care which are not nursing, uh, where my department can play a role. And the member will be aware of the new system, for example, of youth training uh, that we uh, launched uh, in June of, of this year. And I, I do expect that health and social care is going to be a major strand in terms of the future needs of our economy, and that we're putting in place the new, that new uh, work-based learning approach that will be hopefully very attractive to a lot of young people, especially those who are leaving school at 16 who want to find uh, new opportunities. Douglas, uh, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, 
I'm certainly aware of the Open University uh, have been um, being in contact with your department about, about potential courses. Um, would the minister consider widening access to nursing courses by removing means testing for financial support for those students undertaking K101 and K109 courses? Again, I think those are largely matters uh, for the Minister of Health uh, to, take, to take forward. But what I would say is that I think there is a common approach across the executive about uh, ensuring that we have uh, wide, wide, wide access to higher education. Obviously, um, nursing is a key uh, section in terms of our economy. The member will be aware that, for example, um, we published the skills barometer uh, earlier on uh, this month, uh, on the 12th of November, and indeed. Um, the, the, the whole health and social care area, and in particular nursing, uh, was identified as, as a key pressure point in terms of our, of, our, of our economy. So we have a clear need. So it's important that we put in place the policies that don't deter people uh, from going into those areas. That, uh, and in doing so, we, we, we actually facilitate people and encourage them into those areas. Mr. Alex Atwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the minister whether he agrees or not? that one of the multiple missed opportunities of Fresh Start, not least that two party leaders engaged directly with the Prime Minister, was to make any progress whatsoever in respect of city deals, or regional city deal for Northern Ireland, or indeed a university city deal for Northern Ireland, given that the Chancellor has said very clearly that there is no issue of principle in that model being deployed here. Well, I suppose it's really, really the, probably the, the last aspect of that that directly falls to my responsibilities as Minister for em Employment uh, and Learning. And I think we had a debate in the Assembly a few weeks ago around the concept of city deals, and I think uh, people are open uh, to, to exploring that. I think it's important that we, we fully appreciate exactly how it's going to work and whether additional resources will be, will be provided or whether we're, we're going to be repackaging um, resources that are uh, already in our, in our, our, in our gift. Um, we, we do see progress, obviously, around university development in Belfast, and I appreciate there is also a, a, a hunger to see uh, university expansion happening in the North West uh, as, as well. The funding for Belfast is, is in place already. Um, there is uncertainty as to how we are going to facilitate uh, any expansion uh, in Derry, indeed, if, if that is what the business case uh, does indicate uh, as the appropriate uh, way, way forward. So, um, if we do have some innovative ways in which that, that can happen, yes, uh, I am very happy uh, to consider those. Good for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, well, given that last comment in particular, given that there is now to be a budget for 1617 and a programme for government preparations are already underway, will you, as Minister, uh, commit both in, this, in the next financial year and thereafter, in terms of programme for government, commit to taking forward a proposal for a city university deal, certainly for Derry, if not uh, for other cities in Northern Ireland, so that? The door that seems to have been closed in fresh start is reopened. Well, first of all, I need to be conscious in terms of my, uh, my lifespan as a minister, in terms of what I am going to do. Um, uh, I can only really comment on what is in my capacity uh, through uh, to, to May uh, of, of next year. It's likely that we'll be, we'll be considering a one-year budget in the, in the first instance, rather than necessarily going for a, a full a five-year uh, budget. In that way, full account will be taken uh, of the, the, the elections and incoming uh, ministers uh, thereafter in terms of future programme for, programmes for government. But I, I think the member can take a, a, some degree of uh, assurance in that the, the, those type of, of innovative interventions do need to be examined by the executive as a whole. Uh, and, and if we don't uh, fully explore all the opportunities before us, then we are potentially missing opportunities. So I think the comments he has made will be well heard. And uh, I, I fully expect that, whether it's myself or indeed others, uh, whether it's now or in the future, uh, will we'll ensure that those opportunities are fully scoped out. Ms. Rosie McCorley. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, was the decision to end the uh, full-time Irish language degree course a wise one, given the huge success of the Irish language and the, you know, the, the growth of it and the Giltock Quarter and Irish medium education, hugely successful and so many children in the city 
um, being educated through Irish. Was it really a wise decision, Gorham Ogut? Well, let me be clear. I mean, it's not my place to say whether it was wise or, or unwise. It is a decision uh, of the university uh, to take. And as the member is uh, fully aware, uh, the context that they find themselves in was, was not one of my making and wasn't certainly one uh, of their making. And some very difficult choices had uh, to, to be made. It's also important to bear in mind that we haven't actually seen a reduction in terms of the, the full-time uh, opportunities with respect to Irish. What has happened is that the provision has been consolidated in Derry, uh, and uh, we have seen the, the removal of the full-time provision uh, from Belfast. Um, in the future, that situation may, may be uh, re restored, but I never failed uh, to be amazed at the concern that is being expressed about uh, courses being moved into the North West, uh, given that, uh, from particularly Sinn Féin, have been very keen to see uh, McGee uh, develop more and more more as, as being part of our um, higher education landscape. That ends the period of time for questions to the Minister.